Hi, welcome to actually the last Open Security Summit session in February 2023. And we have Jacob, who is going to talk us to a, a, another super important topic, which is, you know, developing, you know, developer, developer driven security, right, in high growth environments, right, which is, you know, some of us are involved in this, where, you know, you have these massive, you know, growth curves in the company, and you have to make sure that they still then securely, right? By the way, in my world, I got what I call legacy. I got enterprise and I got startup. <laughs> so like, how do you balance guidance when you really have three different, very different populations, right? That they all have different requirements. So over to you, and I'm really looking forward. To all right. Session. All right. So actually, this presentation was was also on um, OWASP AppSec, but I think this time we can make it a little bit more interactive. So uh, if you'd like to, in the in the meantime, if you'd like to add something or ask questions, feel free to do it. Uh, I'll try also uh, to speed up, speed it up a bit, so that we we have later a little bit more time for discussion because I think this is interesting. Um, okay. So let's start with uh, with a quick question who owns security at at companies is it the security team or is it the engineers so once you answer this question and set this principle you can actually build really interesting things so i'll show you uh, and i would like to welcome you to the world of developer driven security where the engineers own it because high quality code is secure and in this world each pull request has an associated Jira ticket. Um, Jira ticket at some level of aggregate task, um, epic feature, it, it corresponds to a feature and every feature has a security review. It takes less than five minutes to go through risk assessment. And the risk assessment is just a questionnaire that tells whether a feature is low, medium or high risk and what do we need to do, do about it. Then threat modeling is done by the engineers in our custom tool, and every engineer is trained to do it. Threats and mitigations are stored as code in our database. You can actually query every threat model that was created, at least over the last two years. We have exact line references for security mechanisms, so implementations of the mitigations uh, attached to each threat in the threat model. And we, product security, we're only involved in, let's say, one-fifth of, uh, of the actual threat models. So um, I'm currently with Snowflake. Um, I'm doing product security there, uh, leading one of the security teams in Poland. Um, and the plan for today is I'll simply show you how we do it, and I'll show you a quick demo. By the way, this AppSec program is, of course, a joint effort by all members of the product security team. So like more than 30 people are actually working on this. Hey, hey, Jacob, can you just quickly, go, sorry, can I go back to that slide? I just want to take a screenshot because I love it. Yeah, this one. Uh, that one. Oh, absolutely. Sorry. Uh, I think that that is the best screenshot. There you go. Cool. Sure. Thanks. There will be more. There will be more spot I on. I know, but that's, I that, you. that's so, <laughs> so, that is so spot on that one. Awesome. Okay. Um, so this will be a kind of periodic table of, of an AppSec program. So let's start with a really simple SDLC where the engineers push the code, they do pull requests, uh, and there is no security, right? So we need to do something. We need to implement some security measures. So um, a lot of companies, the first thing they do, they implement tools. So you, you think about SaaS, DAST, software composition analysis, all of the things that you can attach in the CI CD pipeline, make it automatic, preferably. Uh, if not, then manual scans. Um, so this is something called DevSecOps, right? So we have tools that we can run automatically when the pull requests are being um, made. So let's connect two of those and let's make another principle. So from now on, anything we add to this uh, diagram, to this periodic table, uh, we also save its output to the database. So in our case, it's the um, Snowflake Data Cloud. But the most important thing is that any output, so from the SaaS tools, we think about vulnerabilities, metadata from the scans, scans, timestamps, um, libraries that were scanned with soft software composition analysis, repositories, everything lands in a database. All right, so let's go further. We want to introduce manual review or semi-manual review by, by the security team, by product security. So let's say we introduce this review. So now before the code is merged, 
we want to do a review, but we can't review every code change or every feature. So we need to have a mechanism to decide whether we review this or not. So let's say we put a very simple risk assessment that tells us, is it worth reviewing or not? So now we still have a very slow program, but it is still five times quicker than it was 30 seconds ago. So in 80% of the cases, the code is, is low risk and it will go uh, directly to the repository, but in, in one fifth of the cases, we'll have ProtSec come in and make a security review. All right, so let's go further. What, at what level of aggregate do we actually need to do a security review? It doesn't make much sense to do a security review for each pull request because usually a lot of pull requests are part of a given feature or a task. So should it be a Jira ticket? Not really. There are some subtasks that are really simple tasks and they are usually associated with one PR code. But at some level of aggregate, there is, um, there is a uh, Jira issue of a type that is interesting for us. So let's say in our case, it is a Jura Epic because it represents the feature. Feature that is big enough that it's worth reviewing, um, but again, it is small enough that uh, we can do it pretty often. And at the same time, the, the threat model is not very big. Okay, so let's decide that we attach to the Jura Epics, but then we want to make sure that this actually happens. And this is when we got a gift from our release engineering team because they actually needed for some other purposes, a merge gate, a merge gate that requires that every PR title needs to have an associated Jura ticket. A ticket or an epic actually doesn't matter because then with a SQL query, we, we can just match it to a Jura epic. And then we haven't done that yet. I mean, um, at this point, it will be later in the presentation. We don't uh, require a security review, but we have a way to turn it on in Jira. Um, and we have a way to make statistics in a database. How many of these Jura epics had a security review? How many of them haven't? Okay. So the next step is, is something that um, the whole industry is, is actually implementing um, right now and since like five, five or a few more years, security champions. We call them partners. So let's decide that the risk assessment uh, will actually tell us if a given feature needs to be reviewed. If it doesn't, it goes directly to code or it can be reviewed by the security champion. And of course, sometimes the security champion cannot solve all, all challenges and they'll, uh, they'll need a review from product security. So here, again, it is also much quicker. Uh, you don't slow down the engineers because 20% uh, of the cases uh, it is solved, 20% uh, of the cases it requires a security review, but majority of this, so 80% of the remaining, uh, can be solved by the security champion. All right. And then we need two more things because we realized that there are new teams being formed. There are new security champions. Some existing teams need a new security champion. So we needed to somehow uh, create what we call autonomy levels. So Currently, we have uh, three autonomy levels. Uh, they say whether a given feature can be, well, a given team and a given partner. Um, in a review um, for a given feature, it needs to have a review and approval from product security, security champion, or just the engineer peer review. So that's the autonomy level. Um, and then we have the approval schemes. So approval schemes join a few of those. We apply the autonomy level for multiple types of deliverables. One deliverable is risk assessment. Another one is threat model. Third one is validation. I'll explain it in a moment. But we have approval schemes and autonomy levels for each partner. And still, everything lands in a database. So we can query. We can see the situation. We can, um, we can check at which level of autonomy each partner is and each team is. So let's let's build this database um, more. So uh, before because we introduced all of these processes, we need training. So we need to have role specific training for the engineers, for the champions, for product security engineers, and we also need um, training about these processes. So training about risk assessment, training about um, the whole security review process. And by the way, our 
learning management system as well as any other internal tool also has a principle that it, its output needs to be solved in, uh, stored in a database. So now this gets pretty interesting because we can query our database and query like which engineers finished the training, have they completed the security champions training? And then for example, completion of the security champions training increases their autonomy level. And from now on, just when they finish the training, uh, they're able to do the risk assessments by themselves after um, one or two quarters. Okay. Um, because some other tools are also connected to the database, we've got employee data. So because, and, and we have an information about edge managers. So we know uh, which teams, um, which engineers report to which managers. So now we can join this data and first have um, uh, a dashboard about the ratio of the engineers to the security champions. We, we can build alerts on top of that. So we can build alerts when um, there is a violation. I will just explain it in a moment. But we can also build alerts for departing employees or simply that a new team was formed or a new engineer joined or a new security champion joined and they still do not have a training completed. All right. And this thing, custom risk assessment templates, is I think the key part, one of the key parts of, of the whole program. So this actually allowed to speed up the whole security review process significantly and reduce the, reduce the burden and, um, well, improve the feedback that we're getting from the engineers. So before that, the questionnaire was the same for every team. Um, each time they would need to, to, uh, to answer the same questions, regardless of whether they were doing front-end or back-end or infrastructure or uh, some other components. So we've introduced custom risk assessment templates for each team. Um, so we don't ask front-end questions to the back-end teams and vice versa. Uh, and the engineers actually own these questions. So this is a machine that tells whether a given feature is low, medium, or high risk. Uh, we have some expectations about the output, whether it is um, and how how uh, what is the volume going on to the low, medium, or high bucket. Uh, we have some expectations about certain features. So uh, for any given feature, we can tell the engineers we would say it is medium or would say it is high, but they own these questions. They um, submit these questions to, to our repository. We of course we review it so that we make sure that there are right paths to the low, to the medium, and to the high risk. But uh, this really changed everything. So from now on, the team is getting specialized questions, specific questions for their usage of technologies, of the features they're building. So this is awesome. And it takes less than five minutes. There's 10 to five questions. All of them are yes or no. Some of them imply other questions. I'll show it later. All right. And then we introduced um, the threat modeling. So uh, we introduced um, the scheme of a security review that if a feature is low risk, so they've done the risk assessment, they can, uh, they can uh, push the code. If, if it is medium risk, they need to go through threat modeling. And if it is high, they will do something else. Um, so we do threat modeling and we, we decided that the engineers will do it. So we need custom threat modeling tooling. And for this, we will use Stride with some custom rules. What does it mean? I'll show you. So uh, custom tooling for diagrams, um, a prototype for that um, when we started was uh, Stride and automation such as RTMP, Rapid Threat Modeling Prototyping by Jeffrey Hill. This is an awesome idea. Uh, so RTMP allows to uh, limit the attack surface simply. Uh, all you need to do is to assign the zones to the elements on the diagram, and then you don't need to consider all six stride categories for all threats. So for example, information disclosure happens only from um, an element that is in the higher trust zone, and there is a data flow to the lower trust zone. So th these kind of rules that limit the attack surface by 80%, something like that. Um, yeah, so uh, custom tooling that allows easy zoning. Uh, you can read more about rapid threat modeling, uh, threat model prototyping here. Okay, and then the next thing, we want to store the output as code. So we chose Gherkins for that, the Cucumber language. 
uh, the, again, the prototype for that was materialized threats. Uh, so this is a public repo. Uh, it implements actually another tooling, uh, draw IO to draw diagrams, and it generates boilerplates for each generated threat. So for example, for spoofing, we generate this boilerplate given a process causes, causes data flow from source uh, to destination, then when the source attempts to impersonate something or someone else, then and then we uh, create then we uh, fill in just part of the boilerplate. So implement and validate digital identity by, and here we expect the engineering input. So this is the actual threat modeling part and the mitigation that is designed by the engineers. Of course, later on reviewed by us depending on the approval scheme and autonomy levels. So, for example, for uh, malicious input from the user, uh, the mitigation here will be that uh, user input will be validated against a specific format. And this is where the threat modeling part ends. Um, the whole um, output is pushed to GitHub and also to our database, of course. Um, and we do we do the reviews. So majority of the teams with the threat models, they require product security review. They require first, they require um, a review by their security partner. Okay. Uh, all right. So now like, look what we have in the database. This, this created huge opportunity because now we have every threat model in the database. We can query, we can make statistics, we can search how many teams, uh, how many threat models are done by a particular team. We can uh, select entities that were on the diagram for a given team. This is a, an amazing opportunity for data analytics. Okay. And then there is the third step that happens um, after the threat modeling. We want mitigations being actually implemented because just having the threat model is not enough. So we want the validations. Um, and we will also store them in the Gherkins. So when the um, threat scenario, the Gherkin is filled in, um, the implementation phase happens and the engineers implement the security mechanisms defined in the mitigation. And we ask them to provide some proof that they've actually implemented this. This could be a pointer to specific lines in GitHub, could be a pointer to a pull request, uh, or if it is outside code, then some other proof like link to Jira tickets. Um, and also validation requires the same um, approval as threat models. So it goes through the security champion and to us. Okay. Then the pen test happens. So for low risk features, uh, just the risk assessment and uh, push to the code. Uh, for medium risk and high risk, we do threat modeling. And for high risk, we also determine if a given feature is worth testing. I mean, pen testing. So uh, we have the pen test here. Uh, by the way, the threat models are already done and mitigations. So it serves actually as an input for a pen test scope or pen test scenarios. So this is awesome. From the pen test, we, of course, we have some vulnerabilities sometimes. So then, they are also, if it is a feature pen test, not like a global scope pen test, uh, if it is a feature pen test, then we've got vulnerabilities that can be linked to specific features and to specific uh, threat models. And then we can also think about like why this vulnerability is there. Uh, was it the wrong mitigation, wrong security mechanism? Uh, is there a problem there? Or there was no such uh, mitigation in the, in the threat model? but the threat was there or the threat was not there and it means that the threat model was not complete right by the way um, these vulnerabilities can also come from multiple other tools so then we can we can build a lot of dashboards that that make these kind of statistics like um was this repository uh was this pull request scanned with a static code analyzer or software composition analysis if later on a vulnerability was found right we can make a violation dashboard, violations on the SLA for patching the vulnerabilities or violation about the process. So for example, the threat model was not done for some reason or the risk assessment was not done and somehow um, someone completely skipped the, the process, okay? To make it happen, of course, there is a lot of um, 
a lot of culture change required. Uh, there is a, there is a lot of time that we spend doing consultation, you know, office hours, uh, monthly meetings with with the partners to establish some trust. But then, because we have all of that, we have an audit trail, and this is good because we we know for a given feature whether there was a risk assessment, we had the threat model, uh, we had the validations. Okay, so let's add more to this program because now that we have uh, a lot of this and we have a lot of data in our database, we can extend it. So, for example, for specific risk assessment questions, maybe we would like to apply some security requirements at the at the level of the risk assessment. So we don't need to do a threat model because some security requirements will be applied in the risk assessment, and they will lower the risk if if implemented if met. So uh, these security requirements can be linked to questions and uh, served to the engineer as, as Gherkins technically, because they still require the validation, okay? And for certain questions, we may also uh, want to have some other team's triggers. For example, if the question is about PII and storing uh, credit card data, we may want to flag compliance and they will be flagged on um, on a given PR with, with the risk assessment. And, uh, and maybe it will automatically start a consultation process with them. OK, so that's it for now. I can't share much more. There are many other projects that we're thinking of. Uh, some of them we've already finished. Some of them we've just started. Some of them we just started thinking about them. But having this data in the database creates a lot of opportunities. So. Uh, this set of opportunities and this setup um, uh, is called AppSec Data Lake by Jacob Salasi, who leads the whole product security group at Snowflake. So why a kind of AppSec Data Lake? Because now with SQL power and thousands of data points, not only from the security review program, but also from many other programs, vulnerability scanning, I uh, think um, other tools that are being run in the organization, we can just uh, collect this data, do some cross-component queries. And for example, we can select from teams where the partner ratio is, um, is not seven to one. We can select risk assessments that have um, high risk and automatically create a Jira ticket for pen test determination without any manual intervention. Um, we can uh, select from teams where... Um, uh, we can select a team that, that is on a given review uh, and an owner of the feature, and we can assign the required reviewers automatically in GitHub, and we can do the violations dashboard. Okay, We can select threat models where a given entity uh, was, um, uh, in a given entity, there was a, a high risk vulnerability found previously. Okay, um, And the last one, for example, we can select from all of the vulnerabilities, they group them by category, uh, sort by number of issues or um, impact of the issues, and we have good candidates for what kind of new, uh, not role specific, but technology specific training we can start, uh, we can create. All right. So that's it. Um, I'll show you a quick demo uh, of, of this program. Uh, so first, um, it will be not a live demo, of course. Um, I can't show all parts of the system, but I can show you the view of the risk assessment. So here is how you choose your team. You put your Jira ticket and a description of your project. This also can be automatically pulled from Jira. And you select some other teams that the project depends on. Uh, so uh, for example, a software engineering team um, for a given feature, they need a cloud component, and this is created by the cloud engineering team, DevOps team. All right, and which technologies, languages, and framework are are being utilized? So uh, internal technologies that have some specific requirements, or just um, technology stacks, so React, C++. Think about that. We can automatically ask certain questions related to these technologies, or we can um, apply some security requirements. So here is the questionnaire. Uh, some questions imply other questions. So for example, direct security involvement could be product security or compliance. Uh, questions have associated risk level for the calculation. Um, there are specific questions with some corresponding security requirements. Not all of them have it. And there are, of course, questions leading to other uh, risk levels. So for example, to medium risk. 
usually 10, maximum 15 questions per uh, for a given questionnaire template. So when you click complete now, uh, there is a next step. There is actually, um, you can accept the security requirements or not because you have some reasons not to do it. So we've got the risk level, uh, you've got um, security requirements. So for example, there were there was a question about changes to the privileges. And then the requirement is that the changes to RBAC must be documented according to some policy. Or creating a new cloud resource required an approval from a given team. Um, OK. So then clicking complete here uh, makes a pull request to GitHub so that all of the deliverables are stored in GitHub and also in our database. So then in GitHub, there could be specific approval schemes applied. All right. Uh, this is a quick demo of how it is being drawn in, in our tool. So we create the, um, the entities, let's say an engineer uh, would like to draw a diagram in the dev portal. The rectangles are entities, the circles are the data flows. Really simple tool. Uh, because we don't want to overcomplicate this for engineers. Just a few buttons. And uh, all they need to do is to create a diagram, connect the data flows, uh, mark the zones. So then uh, the, the custom rules can be applied. And then when you click generate threats, certain stride categories will be generated. So now we have only a few of them that apply. Okay. In the Gherkins, uh, you provide the mitigations. And then when you fill in all of the um, all of the Gherkins, you can submit the PR and automatically submits the PR to uh, to GitHub. So that's it, technically. That's it for the threat modeling phase. Go to the next slide. Uh, so this is the view. Uh, we uh, expect from the engineers to draw the diagram, sign the zones. We generate which threat categories apply. We can mark certain entities as out of scope, but we would still want them on the diagram. Uh, we fill in the gherkins. And that's it. We've got the last slide about metrics. Uh, so with all of this data in the database, with, with AppSec Data Lake, uh, we can actually have continuous maturity assessment simply as SQL query and additional visualization. So this is um, this this is an example uh, training and education roadmap uh, dashboard. So uh, we can have queries and visualization about um, training completion by cost center, completion by time. So for example, um, I assume those those dips are are new acquisitions or new training being created that. Um, we didn't have time for the engineers to um, to, to do it. Uh, completion by module, you can do also other visualization about that. Uh, so this is like a huge opportunity for uh, for like continuous maturity assessment compared to um, some questionnaires where you like once per quarter, once per year, you fill in the some questionnaire, uh, you assess your maturity against uh, three levels. Uh, so here you've got actually numeric percentage uh, of of um, compliance to, or not compliance, but the, your maturity level. All right, that's it from me. And um, I think we can start an interesting discussion about that. What do you think? That is pretty awesome, right? Like amazing stuff, right, you've been doing. And, and you build all that on top of the um, Snowflake platform, is that? So the um, the visualization part, the alerts, the violations dashboard, and um, these parts are uh, yes, they're built on top of Snowflake. Uh, the custom tooling that's internal tooling. So that's uh, the, these are internal applications. Maybe uh, maybe we'll rebuild it at some point into into Snowflake. Cool. Because one of, one of the questions I asked there was that on the chat was about um, oh, chat. just. The, um, like, are you using, for example, notebooks for any of these? Like, do you wire up some of these into notebooks? Do you kind of, you know, because because basically what I, what I love about it, the idea of of the data lake, right? I like the idea of having that place where you can connect the dots, where you can basically, um, you know, suddenly a lot of the queries. It's, it's kind of like you know, like we, we we have a lot of people have Splunk or Elastic or these things, but 
I, I think you really embrace the idea that you want to bring all this sort of metadata, all these other bits of information to one location so you can query it, right? Yep. Um, you know, and I think that's, that's a, an amazing concept, right? And I kind of uh, I tend to, I like to think of it as S3 into that path where, again, you know, that becomes the disposable, but it's not the idea to have this central location to have all these different metadata, not necessarily a crazy amount of logs, but literally a metadata about what, what you know, all our security world, I think is, is super powerful. Yep. Yeah, so not specific, not specifically Jupyter notebooks, but we we do have like our own visualization uh, tools within our platform. But um, we also have the tools for uh, making the automation part. So, for example, automatically um, creating Jira tickets or GitHub integration, marking specific teams for uh, for approval. I can't hear you. Yeah, sorry, I was just. Uh, right. just yeah, and and, uh, and I think that that that's that's pretty cool, right? And um, and then this is used by the security team, right? So you guys use this internally to to get that level of visibility and reporting, right? And and. Uh, but we're we're also happy to present it to the engineers or yeah. to the engineering managers to see, yeah. you know, uh, so that they see how it's going. Yeah. It's uh, also like when you have this in the dashboards. Uh, the discussion with the leadership is much easier. Exactly right. Have you been able to connect that to the risks that, and then have almost a scalable risk architecture where your risks are now connected to basically the graph that you you build in a database? I can't share much about okay. that. <laughs> right? All right. Right. It's definitely look. Um, these yeah, the, these topics. The, there are the ideas that we definitely discuss. Right. Some of them get implemented. Uh, some of them not, but yeah, I uh, maybe let's rephrase this question into: Would it be interesting to do it? I think connecting this to risk would be really valuable for any company. So yeah, look, look you know, one of the things that maybe you know, I'm going to try to see if we can share next next summit. Like, so I, I've been doing a lot of stuff in Jira, right? And we build this gigantic graph database on top of Jira, but Jira sort of sucks for querying, right? And and the way I found Jira super effective is that so actually. I actually have an offline copy of the Jira stuff where I synchronize it and I just load the latest one. And also in the past, I've done cases where I would pump that to Elastic or the equivalent of your data lake, right? So, so in, in a way, like, because um, I think you guys are doing that too, right? You're pumping data from Jira into your data lake, correct? Or you're accessing Jira directly? No, that integration part. Uh... So where's the Jira data? Do you, do you actually go to? No, Jira? we Jira is one of the tools that we that we everything we put in the in the database. So we yeah, also yeah. have so, these so data there. Seeing, but but we but we do have. Data. But you yeah for some uh, for some automation of course you need to call the Jira API directly. Yeah, yeah, fair enough. But do so you so how does it work? So when something changes in Jira, you get a hook and then you 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 populate the change in your database. That as well, yes. Yeah. So that means you you can query your database, right? Instead of querying Jira. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. So so what's really cool about that is that so so do you have you formalized your graph? Do you actually have a graph database to kind of treat it as a graph in terms of the structures, the connections, the things you can do with it? Well, it, it, no, it is it is a graph, but we well we store it. Uh, so you, if you mean thread models, or do you mean connections? No, no, no. I'm you saying that. For example, if you look at even the geo relationships, right? You know, when you describe it, it's a gigantic freaking graph, right? Because yep. you're saying I can navigate right. from here, yeah, yeah. From there, etc. Right? So you know, and and that's super powerful because now you can create relationships. You can start to see the relationship between the thing, and then as soon as you add a bit, like if you can map the stakeholders, then you can connect stakeholders to it. If you yep. add the org chart, you can connect the org chart. If you map the architecture of a system, right? If you know, I, I almost like. I guess maybe a follow-up question. Do you get to the point where you don't have to draw the architecture? You already know the architecture because you already have enough data to how the systems talk to each other that you actually go, hey, guess what? This is what your architecture looks like. <laughs> and they go, really? And they go, yeah. You know, this, you this, this will be very interesting. So uh, matching the design with the actual implementation or the, current, exactly, state of the, right? or the current state of the infrastructure, right? Yeah, but you need to pump that to your world, right? Like, so you can you can get that feed from AWS, you can get that feed from other tools. A lot of these tools have bits of the puzzle, right? It's just like, and, and I like, I, I really like your. We definitely need to do a, a session next time on this whole security data lake, right? Because I, I think there's lots of insane potential that we should be defining that pattern 
a bit better, right? Because I think there's a lot of power in it. Yep. Andrea, just uh, any anything, and Michael, please feel free to chip in. You also are. You guys are all co-hosts, so. I I wanted to ask a question about the level of resistance, Jacob, that you've met or that you guys receive from the development team, if at all, mm -hmm. when you try to or when you began to implement this. <laughs> Oh, like for sure. Um, so I joined a year and a year and a half ago. Uh, the whole program is, is, at its current shape is, is two years old and there was some work uh, done before that. So of course, these were like ups and downs, multiple phase, for example, um, the, the, the custom risk assessment templates were implemented only later. Uh, and many other parts of, of this process were, were implemented later on after getting feedback from the engineers, from the PMs, TPMs, from the engineering managers. Um, so we collect this feedback. And yeah, if we see that um, something is not working, because let's say there is a team that has 1,000 tickets, uh, because that's the way they work, and they would need to do a risk assessment for each of them, uh, so tens of them daily. Then we need to align our process a bit better, change something, and um, you know help them still be compliant with the process, but to not to not cause them a lot of work, right? So, for example, for for this situation, we've came up with with um, accelerated risk assessment that for for uh, these kind of situations allows them to make the change and uh, do not go through the formal risk assessment in the in the tool. So do you guys I see you also asked a question about like um the ratio of engineers to support this. Um, so I think this is um this is a question um that we just uh we, we have some ideas that are uh from some public presentations and the industry collected knowledge. So uh I think the the golden ratio according to the industry is is uh, seven to 10 engineers per one champion and then seven to 10 champions per one security engineer that is supporting the assurance team. Cool. And security champions are embedded in the teams, right? Yes. Yeah, they're part of the development. Yeah, that, that makes, yeah, that's yeah. right. But what, what I think is also very powerful here is the fact that, you know, you guys completely represent the whole idea that you need to have engineering capabilities within security. And we need to be building scalable platforms that then a the developers can also see that you know there's scale on it, and then you're not you're not going to them with pens and papers or spreadsheets and stuff like that. Yep. Right? Yep. And also you need this given the scale of the thing, right? Like you said, like you 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 need you know hundreds thousands of people using this, right? It cannot be you know a, a, a something you do in Jira or mom and pop right here. You need to have a proper architecture yep. and you approach it as you would approach other things. But it's driven by security, right? It's a, it's yep. fundamentally. A, uh, yeah, that's right. There, there, there are also two principles here. One is that, uh, yes, everything we, we do needs to scale. Like we grow, yeah. for the last few years, we've been growing 50% a year. Uh -huh. So uh, we need to be prepared for like 10x grow and, and these tools need to need to support that and these processes. So that's one thing. And the other thing is that the, the thing that you mentioned about whiteboarding, I love whiteboarding thread modeling. I've been doing that for a long time and this is actually the most uh, effective and time effective uh, way of doing thread modeling, especially for new teams. I actually got uh, got those five minute thread modeling videos on YouTube. Uh, but then doing this in an organization that needs to scale and uh, needs to evolve, uh, doing this on a whiteboard or any other way that we're not storing the output would, would be simply um, loss of time, right? Yeah, absolutely. Cool. Michael, any comments or questions from your side? Yeah, I guess the Wait, uh, sorry, I think the audio is not very good. Or is it just me? I haven't heard that as well. Yeah, I think your audio was a bit off there, Michael. Okay. No, uh, it's very, very far away. Maybe you can write on the chat or. <laughs> you were fine it's like, before. But... It's like you connected, right. you have your headphones on the table and it's picking up from the headphones. No, how about now? Better. Okay, cool. Yeah, I think it was just using the laptop speaker for some reason. I don't know why. Um, yeah, I asked a question about the, the ratio because I'm always interested to go like, okay, what does that company do? What does that company do? Because like we came up with ratio as a starting point because we've got to start somewhere. Um, but I can definitely see how once you get this model in and you get the data, you can start to make that a data-driven decision rather than just kind of, I just kind of guess a ratio and see if it works. Whereas with this, you have the data to actually support to see well, how busy you guys are and how much extra 
extra time you need or if, if you're you're getting too busy and it's like okay we need more champions over here or we need another product security person over in this area to be able to support or i suppose the, the other thing is once you try and forecast what's coming down the pipeline in the portfolio and try and see what's what's coming because you said you you'd support like hyper growth as well um but yeah yep like exactly data driven so like we've already observed that there are some teams that create a lot of small features and there are teams that create less uh, smaller number of bigger features so those that do uh, risk assessment threat modeling um, rarely they need less security champions right well, I mean not not linearly but still uh they, they need a bit less security champions that's right Are the security champions the team leads? Um, often, yes. We've got some requirements. We've got criteria for them. Um, so, yes, they can't be you know too junior on the team because they won't be able to push for security decisions, or they could be simply you know um, not not have the the the, the power to 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 discuss these things or simply they won't learn about those things because they don't take part in in the key design decisions so we've got some expectations about that yes uh ang leads yes but eng managers no I don't think for instance, i gotta be honest with you I, I'm, I'm resisting what you presented given many years as a developer from the standpoint of some of the things that you've implemented i considering engineering work and others security work. So in the use and abuse cases, that to extend the knowledge of developers, they're great, I think that is brilliant. Uh, and uh, the users that you guys were giving to Berkey, brilliant as well. The beginning part of Jira, I would leave that completely to the developers. I don't think that unless uh, you don't have automation when you push that to the cloud, messing around on that is actually their goal. And, and the way that the presentation came, and this is constructive, uh, that's how I meant, meant it. Uh, uh, it actually felt like rather than standing beside the development team, you're babysitting them. So my question regarding the team leads is like, um, are you guys going to grow them into the security team? So is that the career path inside of the company? Or is it like that they have their own parallel development and this assistance as a develop, uh, developing the skill set and the champion is to, to empower their knowledge? So I wanted to ask you a bit more about that, if you can share. Okay. All right. I don't think we're babysitting them because this is autonomous and because some engineering, uh, because the engineers can actually. Um, perform majority of the actions by themselves. I don't think we're babysitting them, but on, you've, you've got a very good point. Um, um, uh, delegating too much work to the security champions would, uh, would make them technically work for the security team. So still with, with this setup, I don't think the champions spend more than 5% of their time doing the security related stuff. So this is this is one part and the other one is technically like long term and because the process is autonomous i think like any engineer would be a security champion i mean at some point i mean when when they've done enough risk assessments and threat modelings and they've been reviewed by uh the security champion or prodsec for you know 10 or or 20 threat models then technically they've got enough information and and enough knowledge that they can uh they can actually become the champion by themselves we like maybe we don't even need to call the champions champions but the reviewers all right so maybe at some point and i, I have an interesting discussion with Izar tarandak on upsec uh global uh is should this be the next point of the evolution for uh for the security champions program right five ten years ago uh majority of the security responsibility was on the security team then the security champion idea came in so maybe the next step is to delegate it further to the engineers right and so that everyone would be a champion so the bit that surprised me on your, your reply was that, that it's only five percent of their time um I've, I've been really busy before so if i actually were given more work on top of what i already had when i was a developer i wouldn't be very happy but i would love it because it would extend my knowledge and from what you guys are actually doing, the way that you can extend that further, and I wouldn't go towards security champions. I would actually bring people into the security world, into creating more AppSec-ready people. 
And I think that is actually really, really valuable. And, and, and we, and yeah, but we don't want to steal the engineers from the teams, right? But we actually need the people, you know. So, and the evolution will eventually be that, right? If they get to the point that they are so good and they really have transferable skills, then it's asking you the question if you're actually treating the, the leaders already because they're, they're ready to move, then they can bring somebody else into their level and they can move on. But where do they want to move on? Do they want to move to management? Do they want to move to security? So that, in a way, would actually solve one of the problems that we, well, everybody says that in security, we have issues, the lack of skills, which is brilliant what you guys are end up doing there, which is really cool to see. All right. Was it, when you were building all of this, was it built entirely within the product security team or did you have to draft in resources from some of the other engineering teams as well like to get the data models set up to get it working like how much external dependency do you have on dealing with this so if, you know just say for example i wanted to like hey i'll go build one of these as well as like what what skills did you need to draft in to be able to to achieve this so we do have a software engineering team um, inside product security mm -hmm. that they're working on um on internal tooling on um, li secure libraries and and all of other interesting projects, um, and I can only refer to the time when 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 I started. Uh, th this was built probably a, a year before I joined, uh, but I know that like uh, the feedback was collected from the engineers from uh, from the uh, people who are in the SDLC are taking part in the SDLC, so also PMs, TPMs. Cool. And engine managers, right? So before everything happened, there was actually an agreement from the engineering leadership that that's the way to do it. Cool. Thank you. Awesome. Cool. That's it. Should we drop it up? Stop the yeah, recording. Cool. Good stuff. Or do you want Denise? Do you want to do some closing notes? Or no, no, I think work? I think we're good. I think this was a you know a really great session. I think definitely, I think we need to explore the um, the whole security data lake. I think that's definitely a great topic for the for a follow up session. So cool. So thanks, thanks, Jacob. You know, it's, I know it's a bit of a late one, but you know it's always good to capture these things and we take it to the next level. Brilliant. That's all right. Thanks, thanks a lot. You guys. Bye. Thank you.